Emily Groover, and this is The Community Show, a monthly base show that brings you your local news and events for the month. And last month, Give Big NRV had many of the local nonprofits hosting events to help with their donations, one of which was plenty. They had their community lunch on Give Big Day and had students from Floyd County High School come to help prepare the food. And tucked away into the hills of Floyd County sits the very first bee sanctuary in the country. Gunter Hauk, founder of Spikenard Farm, is taking initiative to create a more sustainable environment for the bees, as well as to educate those who are willing and wanting to learn. Due to Gunter's enthusiasm and determination, we are seeing more and more sanctuaries popping up across the nation. My name is Gunther Hauk and I'm the co-founder of Spikenard Farm together with my wife, Vivian. Uh, Spikenard Farm was founded in 2006. I was still working at the Pfeiffer Center in New York. It is a place that I helped to found uh, a training for biodynamic agriculture and that was started in, two, in 1996. And I didn't have any idea that I would be working with bees again so quickly. But there was a, an article in the New York Times, The Hush of the Hives, in October, I think it was, in 1996. And I thought, uh, with the bees so much in crisis, maybe I can offer something. And I gave my first organic beekeeping workshop two months later at a farm in New York. And from then on, the bees became more and more important every year. So when I retired in 2007, I had already started Spike Nut Farm. And two, two weeks later, I was out in Illinois with my wife and the crew. And we started uh, Spike Nut Farm in Illinois on 610 acres. A donor had given us the land for that purpose and that is actually what helped to get it started. Um, we didn't have the means to do that ourselves so it's actually a lot of donors, a lot of people who think that this is important, some foundations, lots of people are part of this. This is not just our thing, this is really a community effort to do something for the bees. So we've been blessed to be able to go on every year anew and um, do what we think is very important for the bees and for the world. We look at the honeybee and what the honeybee really does on its own. It has survived millions of years, obviously, without our help. And if you look at the beekeeping practices over the last 100, 120 years, you can see that the primary motive for the changes in beekeeping were um, what was actually advertised once, what makes bee bees profitable? What makes bees profitable? And that only works for a while because everything that was invented, the plastic foundations and the sugar feeding and syrup feeding and a queen breeding, artificial queen breeding, everything, everything that we invented has served us and our dollar sign and it has not served the honeybees. As a matter of fact, it has gone against the honeybees. Spikenard was first created as a space where the bees could be healthy and they could thrive. And in order to create a place where that's possible, it's a focus on the landscape. So the farm component of the honeybee sanctuary includes uh, flowers, acres of bottomland fields, and also uh, trees and shrubs and bushes. And basically everything we've landscaped and all the plants that we're growing here are for nectar and pollen for the bees so that they have the best sources of food and the the basis for the bees to be healthy is that they have a good diverse diet 
And so we're providing all of what they need there. So a lot of our work and a lot of what we do is actually gardening. Um, the beekeeping work is something that happens seasonally and is a huge, of course, a huge part of what we're doing here as well, which is uh, being beekeepers and taking care of our hives. Right now we have 31 colonies here and they are thriving and healthy and strong. They've made it through another good uh, winter, a good season here and the dandelions and you know the orchard is coming into bloom now which is a really great sign that the bees have made it through the winter and they're ready to start a new season. So the beekeeping methods that allow the bees to really make it through the winter time are ones that preserve that fantastic and uh, diverse source of honey that the bees are making. They're gathering the nectar and pollen from the environment and they're making their honey so that they can survive the winter at all. If they don't have that honey, then they can't make it through. And so our beekeeping practices are quite different from most other beekeeping practices in that we allow the bees to have as much honey as they need to make it through the winter time. And then in the spring, in, in April usually, when the dandelion comes into bloom, that's the first big source of nectar that lets us know the bees have made it through the winter and then any honey that's left over then we can harvest and take and sell, you know, things like that. But we don't, we don't harvest in the fall. Most beekeepers will harvest in the fall and then they'll feed the bees sugar or they'll feed the bees high fructose corn syrup, which are substances that actually make the bees sick. It changes the pH of their digestion and becomes more acidic and they have uh, a much greater susceptibility to diseases and um, virus and fungus and things like that breaking out in, in the colony and they become weakened in their immune system and weak bees have a much greater difficulty uh, growing and being strong in the spring and surviving um, than, than ones that are raised on their own honey and doing it uh, you know in the natural way the way that they were meant to. This honey is for the bees first and then for the humans if there's enough so there's a true surplus of honey that the bees always share with hum human beings. You know, on a good year, there's always going to be enough for us. We don't have to worry. We won't get enough. But often we don't worry enough about the bees that they have enough. Biodynamic beekeeping goes back to uh, biodynamic agriculture and the work of Rudolf Steiner, who gave over 6,000 lectures and wrote over 30 books on the most diverse subjects and as scientists in Germany for example not long ago said he's becoming more important because he showed alternatives to all the crises we are in. We are in an economic crisis, we are in a spiritual crisis, we are in an educational crisis, we, you know, there, there is no end to the crisis we are in. and. So biodynamic agriculture started in 1924 when conventional, what is now conventional agriculture, just was really getting into a strong footing. And that is working with the land, with the soil, with a plant in conjunction with the cosmos, not just, you know, looking at chemicals. Um, we have a class here where, where we teach that actually in September and the biodynamic part is understanding the honeybee not only physically. We've made great progress you know in physical uh, discoveries, the bee dances and a uh, oh, fantastic thing that they have a democra uh, democracy, they can come to a democratic decision, fantastic things. But to understand the honeybee actually as a spiritual entity, like the American Indians saw the buffalo and the bear and the fish, they didn't give homage and sacrifices to the physical buffalo. They realized there's a spiritual entity that, which we don't see with our physical eyes. 
And that's our approach to look at the spiritual honeybee and see what that being actually needs. And that's sort of the focus here at Spikenard is um, teaching people beekeeping methods that really work, that actually keep the bees. And I say that because the bees are being lost. There's a really a great crisis happening right now. Uh, in the last two years in America, each year we've lost an average of 42% of our bees. It's a rate that can't be sustained, even looking at the business side of things. If you're trying to get as much money and as much honey, but you have 40% of your bees being lost, something's going wrong with the beekeeping methods. Now it's, uh, it's becoming a matter of um, success to be able to keep the bees. You know, before it was, the environment was clean, you know, we're talking about 40, 50 years ago, the environment was clean and beekeepers didn't have to worry. They could focus on the honey. But now that the environment is so um, destroyed in a lot of ways and the bees have lost their health for so long, um, they're at a place where they can't tolerate it anymore, the beekeeping methods that would only say, what can I get out of you? And so Spikenard is saying, what can we give to you? And in giving to the bees, in serving what they need, actually the bees give us more than enough. These, I feel, are like the canary in the coal mine. You know, a lot of animals are in great need. The bats are dying, the bumblebees are getting lost, the native bee species are getting lost and diminished. So the honeybees sort of tell us um, you have to do something different for the environment in agriculture. And the crisis we are in, are, I feel, is really a blessing. Because a crisis always tells us that the path we are taking is not a good one. And the way we overcome the crisis is actually progress. So I think the way we work with the bees and for the bees now shows how we either can make progress or we are going to hit an even bigger crisis. The basis of this uh, sanctuary um, is, is those beekeeping methods being practiced. And so we're not just teaching, we're not just talking which is the important part of getting the message out that there's, there is a way to keep bees that's healthy. There is a way that, that the bees will survive. You know, our colony's success rates are off the charts in relation to the national averages. And that's because we're focusing on their health and, and they're showing us, yes, this, is, this works. You know, we, we're surviving. So with, with, the, with the bees surviving now and having worked with methods that Gunther has been cultivating for over 40 years now. Um, we've come to a place where we can really share this knowledge through our courses, through webinars, through uh, tours, through events, through writing books and articles and things like that. Uh, we've started to sort of spread the message and we've joined a whole community of people that are doing the same. There, there are more and more people around the world, around the country, around Virginia, around Floyd, that are waking up to that the bees need something different and that they need a different way of beekeeping in order to survive and be healthy. And yeah, so there are people around the world doing amazing things now for the bees and we're joining that stream and supporting it from where we are and from what we can do. Well, we are now at Spike now 10 years old. We are still in a childhood stage, you can say, uh, just getting closer to puberty. And my hope is that Spike Nut Farm can thrive insofar as the need for it actually with every year becomes greater. That these principles and methods come out more into the public 
through books, through articles, through webinars, through teaching. We teach all over the country and, and in Europe and Israel and as a matter of fact, uh, I'll be teaching in Australia soon via Skype. But, you know, so our, our practices go all over the world and the need is there. And so we hope that we get the support, the donations to be able to do the work. Uh, we are not going to get rich on it, but that's not the goal. We want to be able to serve the need. And the need is really there. And we are just this year starting more working with school classes. That's the future. Uh, school classes, university students. A, a class was just here two weeks ago. From all the way from Missouri. They drove 16 hours to come here and work for a week. So that is how I see Spike and Art growing and thriving and hopefully more staff. We're all working having at least five different hats. And so, yeah, with the blessings from above and from people, we can continue this work. Everybody can grow a garden. Everybody can plant a little section for the bees, even if they only have a, a little patio or something where they have potted plants. It's, a, it's such a gift to the bees to have more and more people consciously planting even just a flower or a whole bed of flowers or a whole acre of flowers, depending on what you can do. And having people um, focus on organic, not using a pesticide and making that connection that the bees need a healthy plant. The bees can't take a genetically modified nectar or pollen and do something good with it. It makes them sick. Or the bees can't take a, a plant that has been sprayed with a pesticide and take it into their colony and do something good with it. it. It makes them sick. It's a poison that they can't deal with. So an organic garden that focuses on flowers or even allowing your broccoli to bloom, for example, if you have a vegetable garden for the bees, for the butterflies, for the hummingbirds, because all of these pollinators are in danger. It's not just the honeybees. The bees are really in a crisis and they need our help. And they need more and more people understanding that they're in a crisis and not just saying, oh, I don't care about that. You know, but if we start to change the way that we're mowing our lawn and we let the dandelions bloom, you know, instead of spraying them, or we talk to the people that are working in the roadside ditches and say, hey, please don't spray our, our ditch with pesticides. We're trying to promote a healthy landscape here for the honeybees. Things like that. It, we need to be creative. You know, everybody can do something. There should, we shouldn't close any doors. The, the doors should be wide open for people to really be creative and say, okay, how can we address this? How can we rise to this challenge together? Throughout the season, we're open every Friday and we sell some of the best plants for the bees, some of the best sources of nectar and pollen, and they're beautiful to the eye as well. You know, the, when the sanctuary is blooming with these plants, it's just a magical place to come and experience um, with all of the insect life that, that comes to visit us, and the birds too. Um, and on those tours, we open people up to the magic of what a honeybee sanctuary can be for all of life, and, and human beings too. It's a sanctuary for us where we can come and engage with nature in a different way and have a walk in a place that's completely clean and focused on uh, the environment and, you know, flowering trees and bushes and shrubs. And so the tours are a really wonderful opportunity to learn more also because we'll go to the beehives and we'll talk about uh, the different ones, the different hive shapes and sizes. And we, we have all kinds of different fun things for the bees here to, to show. And then, um, yeah, we have a little farm store, a little place where people can buy our products. Um, and that's on every, every Friday from 11 till 6. And it starts April 28th. And every Friday we're open for people to come learn and garden and work along with us. And that's from 1 p.m. until 6 p.m. on Fridays. Our workshops, we teach some very basic beginning how to get started with the bees. 
and we start with the equipment and where to get these and all those very basic nitty-gritty details. And those workshops are generally at the beginning of the season when you need to start getting ready, so February and March. And then we have our first two-day um, workshop in April, and that goes a lot deeper into these methods and kind of goes through the whole uh, cycle of the year in terms of the beekeeping methods and what people need to know and this greater philosophy of biodynamic beekeeping that we're teaching here. And so you get a much fuller picture um, in that April workshop. And then our workshops get even more in depth as we go. And we have a one week workshop where people can come for almost a retreat experience here at the sanctuary, where half the day we're focused on the bees and beekeeping. And we'll actually open hives and go to the bees every single day together. It's very practical, very hands-on. And we have one, um, we have one this year in May and one in July. And those week longs, we also take the afternoon and we focus on the landscape. So we're gardening too, working with the forage for the bees and transforming the land so that um, they can learn that aspect as well. And then we have a two year beekeeper training program where people can graduate uh, with a certificate in sustainable beekeeping. And that is for people who really want to learn all of the details and the full picture of our beekeeping methods. And we have some great success stories of people that have gone through that and then started an apiary of their own or a project of their own relating to the bees and have really are taking on this message into their own places and into their homes and their communities. I can say that we are very grateful to have more people realize that this is very important and give us the support of good thoughts, of volunteering, of donations, small and large. We, had pe we have people giving us $5 or $10 and we also have people giving us $150,000. So we have no upper limit, of course, <laughs> and uh, we are very grateful that we can do this work and build up a sanctuary on a location as a practical demonstration and experience for what can be done for the bees. The Honeybee Sanctuary is a place where you can come to get absolutely enthusiastic about the beauty and the joy of working with the honeybees. And it's a magical uh, relationship that the human beings can have with the honeybees. And you ask any beekeeper, they've, they've fallen in love. And we're here to allow people to fall in love with the honeybee all over again and get started on the right foot towards saving the honeybee. And like Alex said, you don't have to be a beekeeper in order to help. You could plant a small garden or flowers right from your patio. Anything can help. And we hope you take this initiative to go out and help your local bees. If you want more information, you can visit them on their website or follow them on Facebook. And be sure to stop by on Friday afternoons to either volunteer or get a tour of the sanctuary. And another hidden gem is on the back roads of New River Valley, an event venue that was created by a bluegrass-loving father, and the business is still being carried on through his son. bought this property about 10 years ago. Um, this barn was a, had been a loafing barn when this used to be a working dairy. Uh, and when we bought it, 
the people that we bought it from had, had beef cattle, not dairy cattle. There'd be some, some farm equipment in here. There'd be, uh, you know, like stuff, furniture and stuff when they move from one house to another, just, just storage. And it was, it was pretty rough. Um, this was my dad's dream was to tear this, tear it down and build it back and have a bluegrass gospel music venue. And, uh, that's what he did. Um, we had to take out a lot of little stalls from where it, you really, what it, I mean, it was still set up for, for dairy cows. There were stalls and straw and everything, little mangers for them to eat out of while they were loafing. Um, we'd tear all that out, redo the concrete floor. Um, we left the, the main structure itself is the same. Um, the metal side, the metal roof, the skylights, they're, they're all the same. Dad has been involved in bluegrass and gospel music since the 1950s, and early, late 50s and early 60s. Um, and he, he used to know several people in Nashville. Um, and of course, Dad's health is failing now. And a lot of the people that he knew in Nashville have passed on. Uh, but he still does have some people he knows, um, and he's used his contacts through that. Um, most of the people that he that he would still have contact with would be the older generation. Um, you know, very very few of the younger younger type play, people would he would he be able to get a hold to. Had Dalian Vincent been here? Rhonda Vincent's been. Um, James King has been here. Um, the young the young group called Gravel Road, they've been here several times. Uh, we are part of the Crooked Road. We've had Ricky Skaggs. Uh, he's going to be here again just, just this week. Um, probably, if he's not the biggest name we've had, it would have to be Ralph Stanley, Dr. Stanley, before he passed away. He's been here three or four times with, uh, with his grandson, Nathan. And one time, they wrecked the bus right here in the parking lot. Um, but anyway, it, uh, somebody was helping a motion to back into the spot and they weren't watching one of the sides and knocked a huge glass out of the, of the bus, like uh, probably 10 or 12 feet wide and about five or six feet high. And they had to get it replaced that night before they could get on the road and go somewhere else because they had to be somewhere else down in, I think, Carolina or maybe South Carolina the next day. So they had to get it fixed. They were out there working on the, on the window of the bus while the concert was going on in here. So that was not, I mean, it's memorable, but it's not enjoyable. We try to have uh, somebody big in the spring before the wedding season and somebody in the fall after the wedding season. Um, and then we might fit in a few smaller, once the wedding schedule gets set, we might fit in a few smaller acts um, that we don't have to have much time to plan for. But um, this, this, uh, this fall, coming in November, we have Rhonda Vincent will be here. Um, and she's been here before, and she puts on a really good show. Um, her and her group called The Rage is her backup band. And opening up for them, we have some young people, most of which are fairly local. They're out of the Galax and down in North Carolina. And they call themselves Shadowgrass. And they were on the Steve Harvey, the show that Steve Harvey hosts called Little Big Shots just two weeks ago on Sunday night. And so we're really excited to have them. Um, you could tell by watching them. They didn't tell us, tell us where they were from on TV, but we could tell by listening to them watching them that they were, they were fairly close and fairly local by their accent. And my wife got to looking before the show ever ended, and their booking agent lives in Galax. And so that was pretty cool. So we, we called them. The next day they called back and... We set it up, so we're excited to have them come and to open up for Miss Vincent, that, and that'll be in November. That's one of the neat things about this place. Backstage is really not even backstage. We just open a door and it's here. Um, and I mean, they just come right right behind where they sang and set it a set it at one of these white tables, and and the whole group will sit here and. There'll be a huge line of people. They'll bring guitars, banjos, mandolins for somebody to sign, sign the back of the ticket stub, and and you know 
some of them, a lot of them wanted to talk to Ricky the last time, but some of them wanted to talk to some of the, the other musicians in the band too. Uh, Kentucky Thunder is what his backup band's called. But uh, he, he's very gracious. Um, I think the last time he was here, the show ended 9, 15, 9, 30, and it was almost midnight before he got on the bus after doing all the, all the autographs and handshaking and all that. And then, and then my dad, he got with my dad, and they, dad toured him around the barn to show him some of the memorabilia from back 50 years ago of dad doing some shows with Flatten Scruggs and some of the other, um, Bill Monroe, some of the older, uh, older people, the fathers of the, what we call the forefathers of bluegrass. I mean, some of them, some of them let people get up on the bus and look at their tour bus. I don't think Ricky Skaggs will do that this week, but we've had several people, several people got on Dr. Stanley's bus and looked around with him. Um, and they're just, I mean, they're just normal people. I mean, that you, you really can't tell that they're famous. Um, you know, I don't know if, I'm sure if you go to Renwick Civic Center and see some of these big, big acts, they're going to, you couldn't get this kind of access and the people are probably going to act a little different. But out here, I mean, they're just, they're just normal people that are raised up in the country like us. And I mean, just, they can just, they got a God given gift, whether it's singing or picking or whatever, they just, you know, everybody's got a gift, but theirs is, theirs is music and, but they're just normal people. And they just, that, you know, they'll come in and sit down and eat with you and they, you know, meatloaf, barbecue, fried chicken, mashed taters, green beans, whatever. I mean, they just like the rest of us. Something that has just really gotten huge in the last couple of years, people getting married in a non-traditional church venue um, where they want to do a, a barn wedding or outside or whatever. But, to, um, you know, and we stay fairly well booked up from May through October. We're, uh, I think coming up this year for 2017, we've got 18 different weekends booked for weddings. Uh, and most of the dates we still have open are rather undesirable due to whether it be Memorial Day or Labor Day or July the 4th or something like that. So to dates that pe typically people would be traveling or at the beach or something with their family are the dates that we have open. But And then we do other stuff as well. Um, we've done some high school reunions. We've done some birthday parties, done some anniversaries, you know, and we can, we can do some off-season events as well, um, especially if they're smaller in number. Um, cause we can Part of the barn is insulated. We can heat it up. You know, if we did an event for less than 100 people, we can definitely get it good and warm for the folks. For the weddings, we, we do offer another barn um, that a lot of the young ladies get married at, and then we'll come back to the barn we're in now for the reception. And we've got a, it's a tractor-pulled wagon. It's an old hay wagon we've had refurbished. It's uh, got church pews on it and safety rails, and I'll take the, the guests back and forth from one barn to the other, and then I take the bride and the bridal party, show the, escort them out there with the tractor and the, and the wagon just before the ceremony. And they, they really like, the, the wagon's really a big, a big deal. I mean, this is, this is my dad's dream, is this, this, this place here. The, the, the barn itself is my dad's dream. And um, I feel like to honor him, I want to keep doing this in, for his legacy. Even, even though he's still, his health has failed some, even though he's still able to, to come to the shows and join him, even, you know, if something, if his health were to deteriorate more, I think I would still like to go on with this. But, uh, you know, first and foremost, this, this is still a working farm. And as long as I've got breath in my body, it will be a working farm. Um, the, the, both the singings and the weddings are, are still a footnote. I mean, we, the cows and the hay and the produce, that's still where, where my heart's at. Um, but, but we do enjoy the weddings and the, and the, I really enjoy the weddings, meeting, meeting the young ladies as they plan and get their special day ready. And then the, the, the people that you meet through the, through the singings, they're just, I mean, can't find a bad person out there, seem like, when you're dealing with bluegrass music and, and their fans. I mean, they're just super nice. Um, they're, they're good to come and, you know, wait outside till we can get the doors open you know can, some of these artists contractually we can't open the doors till a certain time and the people will come and stand outside an hour hour and a half to wait to come in to get a seat and they they don't complain they don't fuss i mean they just they're it's just it's a good deal so and uh you know y'all haven't been here hope 
Hope you come see us for a future singing. If you want more information, you can follow them on Facebook at Little River Bluegrass Barn and Weddings. And that's all for our community show. And as always, if you have any news or events that you would like to put on the show, you can visit our website at citizens.coop. Go to the CCTV tab under programming, go to the community show tab and put in your information there. Or you can give us a call at 540-745-2111. I'm Emily Groover and thank you for watching the community show. We'll see you next time.